So good to see you. Welcome. We're so glad we could put this together and everything because it's time to bring it up to date. Thank off you. The, off the present State of the Union, we can talk about that. And in the audience, welcome. Welcome very much to Conversations, a friend of Conversations in the world, Kai Hainer. He's the um, uh, PhD, and he's the uh, director of the Henry George School here in New York City. And he's a student of Henry George, a very interesting progressive uh, economist that uh, has had a great influence on a great number of people and probably should have been more listened to than he was, perhaps. We're going to talk about that in other matters. And Kai, thanks for coming in. So good to see you. Thanks for having me, Harold. Over. Let's start from the beginning, a few minutes, your own background and so forth. And we want to talk about Henry George. And we also want to let them know that there's going to be, due to popular uh, acclaim and so forth, a reshowing of the movie that was done under the auspices or in a co coordination with the Henry George people called the end of poverty exactly yeah. question mark exactly and so forth we're going to let them know because that's going to be re-aired again we want to let them know about that but share your own personal background we've done it before but share and then we'll get into a discussion of Henry George and this film and the state of the modern economy both uh, up to the time in which the president addressed this last night and as we begin to look into the future but Share yeah. your own background, please. Thank you. We had, uh, I got a master's in uh, economics, classical economics, David Hume's influence on Adam Smith, PhD in history. Uh, it was what? Master's in economics. Yeah, but you said Hume on Smith. Hume's influence on Adam Smith. Very interesting. Yes, yes, Very interesting yes. to me, the Scottish Enlightenment. Yeah. Yes, and uh, uh -huh. sort of the origin of the classical economics school. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I got, did a PhD on the intellectual the ideological origin of the Holocaust, actually. And um, that was hard work. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I've done uh, journalism and schools and uh, was a associate professor at the University of Berlin. And now I'm, for the past six years, I've been director of education at the Henry George School here. Yeah, very good. Yeah, it's a great school. On 30th or 20th? 30th Street between Thir Lexington and Park, yes. Major, and it's been around for quite a while. Uh, we're going to be uh, <coughs> celebrating our 80th anniversary in uh, two, two years. <coughs> 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 Excuse me, 80th. That's yeah. really been there for a long time. Congratulations yeah. on you. being able to hold the flame for that long. Yeah, somebody, Robert Schockenbach or something, That's who has uh, contributed to keeping the flame of the George's view alive, right, That's and going. Th That's uh, another. That's our. Uh, textbook publisher actually and the textbook publisher just uh, produced that movie that we talked about that opened uh, had a world premiere in December it's been running in major cities in the United States uh, it, it is reopening January 29th in New York mm -hmm. for a couple of weeks and it's playing in uh, France also and okay is other it now? places yes that's very good and it's going on the 29th of January January yes well that's tomorrow yes Okay, and we're taping on the 28th. This won't air until that. But it's very good due to popular acclaim. It's been shown at the UN and other places. Yes. A great number of NGOs and so forth are, are getting uh, on to the message of the film. And we'll be talking. Maybe that's something we could take so. with and combine it with a combination. Because if I'm not mistaken, the film uh, questions the, uh, qu uh, you know, the economy and what's required. Yes. Yes. And it does it at from a uh, George's perspective, perhaps, yes, right? Yes, yes. So maybe you could talk and weave the two things in together and introduce the audience and let you and I talk some about uh, Henry George and his view on the economics of uh, development and how he's distinguished from the, the canon of uh, economic theory. Good. Uh, yes, The End of Poverty is uh, it's an answer, actually, to a bestseller by Jeffrey Sachs. And Jeffrey Sachs wrote The End of Poverty, and he said, if we get uh, some machinery and we get them a better infrastructure, the poor countries, in other words, then uh, we'll have no problem. And uh, we question that, and we're looking basically at the history of colonialism, and we look at um, what you could describe as neocolonialism, financial neocolonialism, yes. that actually the South is being financially exploited by the North with... Uh, interest rates, we talked about usury just now, a speculative yeah. interest. If you have to, if you have to call, uh, if you have to spend all the 
um, money that you have from a loan on the interest and you can't get to the principal, then uh, that's bad. And we were just chatting also for in the normal conscience to people, you buy a house and you, it costs ten thousand dollars. You end up paying thirty thousand, yes. and it's all interest yeah. that is going to the banking industry, I guess. Yes. And it seems to me that all of our wisdom schools, Lao Tzu or Jesus or Buddha or Muhammad or anybody or Aristotle, Aristotle in the Jewish tradition and so forth, there were strong proscriptions against usury. Mm -hmm. And is it the same to be strongly proscribing usury or even the idea of interest mm -hmm. in terms of the economic theorizing? What, mm -hmm. how, how do we deal with that? Because it seems to we certainly have gotten around that proscription. I know there are serious elements, and we just did a program with a young man within the Muslim world yes. where they, have, uh, they try to hold on to the idea of a uh, usury-free method of uh, doing fi uh, financing uh, capital investment and that sort of thing, but it's a big, uh, it's a big issue that we've lived with, mm -hmm. and people expect to pay huge amounts of money to buy their home before they're even touching the principal. And I, I wonder, it's a few things lopped together, but um, what, what's your th take on well, that? Well, uh, in a nutshell. As a thumbnail sketch, we don't want to get into a situation where we have just a lot of financial capital, capital movements and mm -hmm. no productive capital movement. Okay. If that gets divorced from each other, mm -hmm. if, if on the one hand there's a lot of paper pushing and on the other hand there's no productive activity, then actually we have a big problem because money is there to serve the people and the economy and not vice versa. Do we have that? In the modern economy, it's it's right now the financial sector has been bailed out in the crisis, and now uh, we had the uh, State of the Union address. Uh, the problem is jobs, and we're being told again for the umpteenth time we have a jobless recovery. Now, how can we have a recovery if it's jobless? How can we have a recovery if homes are still being foreclosed? The recovery is only a full recovery if people are being put back to work and people money is being put uh, back into their pockets. That's another thing we could question because, in a certain sense. If you don't mind, uh, that usury question is something I'd like to bring brought up. And is there among, because it's coming from the scholarly Islamic world, not yes. from the uh, radical yes. uh, thing and everything. And uh, so that industry will put it on back burner for a while or something. But also the idea of um, a jobless recovery. Um, we got 10% unemployment now, 10% too it got up to and so forth. And a lot of people are, are saying that um, um, Lord Keynes, I've said to you in the past, Lord Keynes wrote that thing, that letter to his grandchildren you're familiar with. And I don't know if I read it right or not, but he did say uh, to their, the, the he wrote it in 1930, to the grandchildren in their maturity, which would be now, that mankind is going to be confronted uh, with um, something that's very hard for them to fathom from the year 1930, but they're going to be f confronted with a massive, a massive technologically induced unemployment. Okay. And here we've got practically most of the world population uh, in most of the economies of the world, the only way they have to have income to buy bread and so forth, is to have what is called a job or a wage relationship or a labor relationship to production. And that somehow there's a, con there's a contradiction if you have a job. The only way to get income to people is to have them have a labor relationship to production. So that brings in the labor theory of value and some of these other things that are part of the theoretical framework all of which is very arcane, <coughs> hard to understand. Um, Shouldn't be Isaac okay. Asimov wrote on every single subject under the sun. I think he had a program that aired just recently here on Conversation we did with him. He could write on everything, astrophysics, physics, uh, Shakespeare. The only thing he could not fathom, he really tried, he couldn't do it, got headaches, was economics. Mm. I can't understand it. But that's another issue that uh, maybe we could address the labor theory of value and the idea that it's all right to distribute income to the mass of the people 
by labor criteria mm -hmm. or the labor, their labor contribution to production. And so much of it goes to the people who own the capital assets that mm -hmm. are so concentrated in so few hands at the pinnacle of world society and all political entities. That would seem to be a problem that doesn't ever come up in the, in the discourse. Let's just get a lot of it and create jobs for people on our estate and we own the estate. Uh, I, I, that's all kind of mixed up, but could you deal with that as well? We're dealing with usury and interest and then the labor theory of value and the idea of distributing income by people uh, contributing their work or their labor to a productive process that is increasingly technological in its base, and that technological infrastructure is all owned by a small plutocratic class in every political entity and the international order. Yeah. Well, we can start. Uh, we can start with uh, interest. Actually, there, there. There's a classic distinction between natural interest and speculative or usurious. Yes, you, usurious, you brought that up. Right. Usurious interest and mm -hmm. natural interest would be. In the old days, capital was considered not primarily financial, but productive and capital. We talked about that also. Ca capita, that's the Latin uh, heads, the heads of the herd, the cattle mm -hmm. that you have. You have a lot of cows or bulls, then you ha you're, ri you're a rich man. Mm -hmm. And when this is your capital, yeah. your livestock, mm -hmm. and you have uh, calves coming from the bulls and the cows, mm -hmm. and then that is your interest, natural interest. I see. Okay. Yeah. Over uh -huh. time, that uh -huh. is what would be considered natural capital interest. That's the classical definition of it. Would that be growth of production, or could yeah. be? You could you could look at it like this, mm -hmm. and then you have the other idea of interest that has been stuck. We're, we've been stuck with for for decades. Actually, is the idea that it's interest on a loan, you pay back a loan, and that if it's small, then that it corresponds to a kind of natural interest. But if it's large, speculative or usurious, and then we have a problem. And what, what, we, we, what always gets mixed in, 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 in modern day neoclassical economics, we have the problem that capital and land or natural resources gets mixed up and lumped in one factor of production, gets lumped in one term, in one concept. And then you have, let's say you have land speculation, you create uh, a monopoly of land, and the land market is artificially being held, is, uh, the land market is artificially made dear. And what then happens is that land prices increase, um, banks love to lend you money on collateral that's backed up by land, by, by real estate, by the, by the land part of real estate. And then at a certain point, the market doesn't bear it anymore, and then the real estate bubble collapses. We had that in 2007. That's what created the present Great Depression. And with this happening, well, you, you call it a Great Depression. Everybody calls it a Great you Depression. You think so, really? Uh, well, it's been uh, it's been even the government acknowledges it to be a Great. No, I'm sorry, Great Recession. Great apologize, Recession. Apologize. Yeah. Great Recession. Sorry. Great Depression. We were is what we, they we were tried skirting. To avoid. We, they were yeah. trying to uh, sorry. They were mm -hmm. trying to avoid the Great Depression, and that's why they had the huge bailout with taxpayers' money of the of the financial sector. Mm -hmm. So, if you are allowing this kind of speculation to go on, then you will always have boom and bust periods. If you could, that's the Georgia solution, if you would tax away the speculative interest and allow okay. only natural interest, and mm -hmm. you do that in taxing, shifting taxes from production, you shift them to na land and resources. Land and resources are not being diminished if you tax them. But if you tax production, production gets always diminished. If you, if you tax let's say a 30% tax rate on whatever, uh, whatever the return is, whatever the profits are, the proceeds are, that diminishes production by 30%. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you're putting the brakes on production. On production. And that's not what you want. Of in the real economy. Exactly. Yeah. And so you want to shift it away from production, so you want to boost production, but you want to shift it onto land and natural resources. And in that sense, people, rather than dealing at it, with it as externalities, as we have been taught by neoclassical economics for over 100 years. D it, it cr creating what as externalities? Uh, creating resources as externalities, resources resource. and raw materials. And, and, raw and because materials. if, if yeah. there is no fee on raw materials, then you squander them. And okay. now we're in a situation, we have 7 billion people, we have 
basic needs for seven billion people to satisfy. That's this. That's the job of the economist. That's the job of of any given economy. That's the job of the of the global economy to satisfy basic needs first, and then higher Thank needs. Thank you. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then higher needs. Yeah, okay. obviously. Okay. I mean, yeah. if you, you if you if you're starving to death, you're not going to want to listen to a Mozart concert. Yes, concerto. right. Exactly. No, that's belly. important. Yeah, that's important. First things first. That's right? why Mr. Marx said it distributed according to need, but it could also finally get to be reasonable wants. Yes, and then yeah. right there we have the problem: where do where do according to to everybody according to their needs or according to their abilities, and that's. Everybody f according to their abilities, according to their needs, and then how legitimate, how long can you, how long is a need legitimate, or how long, I mean, needs or wants in the ultimate or desires are unlimited. Well, are they, yeah, okay. They okay, are ultimately yeah. unlimited, but what you, what you want to worry about is to cover basic needs that are necessary for survival. Well, and I would think that way. That would be something other than social dar Exactly. It would be, it would be, it would be contrary to social Darwinism. But if we look at history, it's always been, it seems to me, a few people who live very, very well in castles and uh, castle keeps even and imperial palaces and in uh, penthouses and so forth. There's a few people who own, th who, who have the power to be at the, uh, the leaders of the society. And then there's the masses of the people in feudal estates, you had serfs. And then we had slavery. Yes. And there's always been a few from Imperial Rome through the kingdoms. And now we have bankers and we have a few people that have all the ownership uh, or have all the power. And it's always been like that. We've never had a real democracy. We've had some things that... Economic democracy, you mean, yeah. Economic democracy. You have we have not had economic democracy. Well, you yeah, also had a truncated political democracy, representative democracy. David Hume contributed. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that probably came out of the Enlightenment along about yes, yes. the time Adam Smith was writing Wealth of Nations and the steam yes. engine was being invented, yes. heralding an, uh, an industrial revolution that was changing things enormously. So we live in a time of great change. This is very interesting, the idea of reasonable interest yeah. and usurious. Yeah. That's an important distinction. Yes. Um, did the wisdom schools, <coughs> or did <coughs> Jesus metaphorically throwing the money changers out of the mm. temple and that sort of thing. Is there, is there a legitimate role for interest or was, was that to have no interest involved in economic relationships? I know there's some schools of thought within the Muslim world that tries to do or set up an economy that has no interest. Okay, well and like we said to you, did we say it, that if somebody start, builds a home you pay you pay two hundred ten thousand dollars for it. You're paying thirty thousand in interest, which somehow you're paying so much it takes you so long to build up the payment of the interest, and that really is something that does. It just seems to be accepted it's very in the modern it, world, it's and very that has to do with usurious or 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 financial paperwork or something that isn't, as you say, adding anything to the production of the economy overall, except for some people who can have the power to gain that kind of uh, income from the people who are buying a house, let's say, or a, a anything. Well, you have uh, the extreme cases, uh, what happened in the last years during the hous housing bubble time. <coughs> <coughs> you have a guy who, who, we have a worker, maybe a blue collar worker who has uh, 20,000, an income of 20,000 annually, and then he, he's been given a, a, a credit for a house of 300000 Now, you can see that that doesn't gel. That's never going to work. How is he going to pay off? How is he going to pay off anything ever, anything other than interest? How is he ever going to go to the principal, get to the principal with this low in income? Okay, so but wait, what's the interest rate? And if I may, hey, Kai, I appreciate it. And this is all basic stuff. For the lower classes, or the less advantaged classes and much of the middle class, the major way in which in America, take America, I suppose it applies to other parts of the world, the major way that they were able to build up net worth in a world where virtually all capital assets are owned by a tiny plutocratic class, one thing that was made available to them was their residential uh, ownership of a house. Mm -hmm. And it was you buy a house for $10,000 
and in 10 years it's worth $100,000, so they've gained $90,000 better than the rate. It was the one way for them to get a little bit in on the power of the appreciation of value as you go into the future, was it not? That's the way they were able to do it. I think the, the and the, that re that that the, reached a certain point where it wasn't sustainable, and the housing bubble uh, came a few few years ago. But no, the cardinal point here is it's not so much a, a, a discussion or question of whether <coughs> we should have no interest or natural interest. Reasonab natural and that, that reasonable that. interest. The question is to avoid usurious or speculative interest. Okay, what's That's reasonable? Did, did, did well, George, deal with, did yes, George, George, George deal with it? Yes, George George dealt with it, and he has this classical position that I just gave you the example of with the, with the calves of the, of the cattle herd. Yeah, I was trying to follow that in terms of an industrial order and everything. Yeah. Well, you have, would have a corresponding rate of interest. Uh -huh. You can put a mat mathematical figure on, on how many, whatever, how many cows come out of a herd uh, of, of cows and bulls over a over year. Can uh, you apply to an automobile factory turning out automobiles? Well, like cows let's say you have, you have, you have a, a herd of 100 cattle and there are, let's say there are 10 or that let there, there are five calves a year, mm -hmm. then that's a 5% inter interest rate. And uh -huh. that you can apply that to the industrial. But, uh, so, well, the, so what George and what the yeah, classics yeah, do, okay. they take the natural interest <coughs> from grains, from, from orchards, from, from natural yield, agricultural natural yield, okay. or cattle yield. Mm -hmm. They take that and they take that as, a, as pointers for a natural rate of interest in the industrial world and the financial world. I now, if okay. it becomes, if it's 5%, that would be like a natural rate. If it's 50%, I'm being extreme now, or 40 or 30%, mm -hmm. then that's not natural. That's usurious or speculative and that will serve that will feed the financial sector and it will not boost the productive sector now the financial sector is auxiliary to the productive sector okay okay you Go cannot on. have if you had a financial <coughs> sector <coughs> excuse me uh, sorry uh, well, bless you if you had a financial sector only and no productive activity whatsoever we'd all be dead we'd all be starving because you cannot just have financial movements and no corresponding productive movements. So finance is an aid to production, not vice versa, because production is there to satisfy our basic needs. Now, if we don't have air, water, food, shelter, and clothing as, seven b as, as, a, as a human entity, as a h human entirety, humankind and in its entirety of 7 billion people, soon to be 7 billion people. Mm -hmm. If we don't satisfy these basic needs, we're dead or we, we will decimate ourselves. So that's our first task as economists. And mm -hmm. that's why the po poverty question is mm -hmm. so vital. Okay. Because nobody says, non, none of the experts, of uh, geologists, uh, natural resources, economists, none of the experts say we don't have enough resources and we don't have enough technology and productive capacity to give air, water, food, shelter, and clothing to 7 billion people. Nobody says that. Nobody says we do not have we it. We have the ability. We have the ability. The capability. In fact, in fact, uh, mm -hmm. there are a good number of people who argue, including George, actually, that we could give air, water, food, shelter, and clothing to 10 times what we have now. So the question is not, can we feed them? Yes, we can, them, but we don't. So why is it that 1 billion people are on poverty line, that they are on $1 a day, that they're on subsistence level? As they always have been throughout history. The trouble is we're getting into conjecture here because when do we start to have fairly reliable statistics? That's okay, like that's true. You go back a couple of hundred years. <coughs> I mean, even yeah. do we know when, when, when uh, Malthus was writing his, uh, his, his, uh, uh, his pamphlet on, on, on population, which is actually pamphlet on overpopulation, mm. we have a conjecture that maybe the world encompassed half a billion people, mm. half a billion people. And he said the world will not be able to digest a mi billion people. So we have now nearly seven billion people, and we, all of us, are proof of Malthus being wrong. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. So we, we can't really... Family size is leveling off by choice. Exactly. Whereas the industrial development happens. You have, you have a function, economic value, economic land value, value of resources is a function of population density. Mm -hmm. And population density, the number of children is in function of the educatedness of the mother. The more the mother is educated, the more the mother is, has been schooled, 
the less children she's prone to have. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, a, that's a means. Mm -hmm. a, a, a woman with a, with, a, with a master's and a PhD is not going to have 15, 20 children. A woman who's illiterate, who's never been even allowed to go to school. Well, half the kids would die in the poverty in which they were brought up. So that's, so they that's, something, we want that. yeah. that's something we want to get. That's a vicious circle we want to get out of. Yeah, that's a Darwinistic thing that you want to avoid. Darwin's sort of nightmare. Yeah, Darwin's right, nightmare. right, right, right. No, that's really interesting. I, that's an interesting thing. But um, so I, I, this interest, this idea between interest and usury or is something... Um, and George had a thing where he was very interested in the land. And yes. he was associated, for those who might not, at the turn of the 19th, 20th century, Teddy Roosevelt was very taken with him, and yes. Tolstoy, yes. and a great number, of, I think Mark Twain. Yes. They were very taken, progressive, he's part of the progressive um, Absolutely. Uh, canon. He's, he's one of the seminal thinkers of the progressive movement. Mm -hmm. what, distinguished him, what distinguishes him from, let's say, Marx, mm -hmm. which had a leading role for okay. alternative thinking. Excellent question. Or others, okay. uh, some of the socialists, Sorrell, I don't know. But what distinguished let's him let's and had him stand on? How much of his vision was able to be realized in practical terms? Uh, what are the legacies of his vision that are relevant to the current situation as you at the Georgia School and people who follow in his... Um, in his in his teachings. Okay, let's do it one at a time. Okay. George and Marx, that's easy. Mm. There's a great distinction. Marx was for a command economy. Marx was for a directed economy. You will exp expropriate the expropriator and you will exploit the exploiter and you will take the property from the proprietors and will take the means of production into the hands of the people because you can't take them into the hands of the people you're going to put them in the hands of a couple of polit commissars or polit bureau well that that would be under the name of government so all power would go into the government and and, and the private sector could be eliminated as we think of it exactly the okay. private sector is supposedly in theory is eliminated under marxism and what you get is that system of councils, council in Russian means Soviet. It's all so every, all power. There's no private public sector confrontation. No. It's, it's all pri pro public sector. It's yeah. all directed. Mm -hmm. It's all directed. By and the Politburo and the apparatchiks. Exactly. And, oh. and then you have the situation that you have the five years plans and in the five years plans it's being stipulated what is the number of, in Moscow, what's the number of toothbrushes in Siberia, five years hence. I think I gave that example mm -hmm. before. And then five years hence, by the time people might have moved away, they might have lost their teeth, they might not brush their teeth, or whatever. So the plan never corresponds to the reality of the needs. Yeah. And what that means is that the five years plan that's done somewhere else, uh, thousands of miles away, yeah. over a five year period is too clunky and mm. is too it's good for developing great big projects and everything. That's true. But it's not very, very good meeting the needs of getting a toothbrush to somebody who needs it. It's not. It's or a screw th or there's a no fine, nail. There's no fine tuning and there's right. no, it's not responsive. It's not right. sensitive. It's not the, the market can serve that purpose. Yeah. So George, yeah. on the other hand, is for a free market system and he's for private property of the means of production. That's an important That's distinction. That's a major distinction. And that... Mm -hmm. Sense. The, the Marxists thought that the institution of private property was the problem that caused the inequities that were so evident in the world, right? And Marx does not, uh, excuse me, George does not think so at all. He does not. No. Not what causes the inequity that we've always had, in George's view, or in his view, as he Mo articulated? Mon Monopoly, m the, the, the exclusion of competition, another big thing for Marx is, that's another big difference between Marx and George. For Marx, Private property is, is, is an anathema, is, is the villain, and, and private property is, and for Henry George, oh, and competition is like the big boogeyman for Karl Marx's competition. Karl Marx is the root of all evil, not the love of money is the root of all evil. For Karl Marx, competition is the root of all evil, and the state has to abolish competition. It's all planned. Wha uh, now, well, Henry George okay. says the opposite. Co competition to the government. Competition between two, two competing between competitors. 
And George says, on the contrary, why would uh, excuse me? Please. Why would he be so against the idea of competition between competitors? What's the, what's for him, the political reality? For him, he says that it's wasteful, and it is that social Darwinism, that's economic social Darwinism, and that's disgraceful, and it's uncivilized, and it it will always get us into the situation that you described. There, a few big owners, few big capital owners, and many. A depressed middle class and many poor, and that's Karl Marx's idea. Is the, the the origin of their problem is competition. Now Henry George takes the opposite viewpoint. He says competition is healthy. Competition is something that we should help and further market level playing field, provided there is is a l the level playing field means provided there's an uh, there's an there's a, a reasonable equality of, of chances so that two uh, competitors entry ability entry. to entry yeah thank you yeah. and to, uh, think of it as the Olympics in 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 in, in ancient Greece mm. where a couple of men were racing uh, with each other against each other you wouldn't put a cripple and an old man with a with a trained athletes you would put trained athletes who all were on a reasonable level playing field to compete against each other to run the marathon, for instance. Mm -hmm. yeah? To run the what? The marathon. The marathon. 26 miles? Yeah. For an old man is crippled, it'd be hard to do. That's it why is. I mean, you would not put, you, <laughs> yeah, wouldn't put right. you, you wouldn't put a cripple or no, a young no, kid no, in there. That no. would be. Oh, they wouldn't compete. It wouldn't that would not yeah, be right, competitive. Right, right, that would not yeah. be proper. That would, yeah, right. that would be unfair. Yes. So you just put people, you would, you would put trained athletes who have trained enough so they're able to do this distance. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're reasonable within each other's uh, uh, range so that it, it creates an incentive. If you, if you put... And this would apply to public sector, private sector uh, negotiations? To both. To or both within an industry? Within, within the private sector, within the public sector, mm. and competing Competition between the... Competition between the two. Between the two. That's and George's view. And he uh, says, George says on the contrary, what is an anathema, what is really the root of all evil is monopoly. And it okay. doesn't matter if it's the monopoly of, of a big uh, multinational corporation, of one big capitalist, or if it's the monopoly of government. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. states, state monopoly capitalism, that mm -hmm. was one description of communism. State capitalism, so yeah. It, it's it's, it's state-run capitalism. Looks it's like China to me. Here you go. You have mm, chi in China, the monopoly of everything is in the hands of a governing council, of a, of a council of political mm -hmm. councils. They've been growing well these last few decades. Well, but also they've been growing well because they, in name, they're still communists, but in reality they have allowed competition on the lower levels. So they don't look very communist to me. They got gated communities and Mercedes and the whole ball of wax about the well. So we have we have we, 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 we have the we have the the problem of what's the reality and what's how is this reality described? Right. What's mm -hmm. the, what's the label under which it's being sold? Yeah, but Mr. George again, he would see thing <coughs> monopoly mm -hmm. of power uh, was the problem, and he had a thing about natural resources should be collectively owned yes. or something. Uh, that's something unique to him, and you were talking about externalities also. Hazel Henderson will talk about pollution. And they deal with those kind of things where you can pollute things, mm -hmm. and they call that externalities out of the financial consideration by which the economy is functioning. And there's a lot of externalities that we should be taking into account for a, a rational and appropriate uh, economic policy for a, for a political entity or something. No. And now, George does not, I repeat, he does not advocate collective ownership of resources. He does no. not. That, again, would be communism. Okay. What he does advocate is private ownership of resources, private ownership of land, but a taxation that does avoid the monopolization of resources. Really, that's a broad general principle. Huh? Yes, that's the general mm -hmm. principle. Okay. And a taxation that <coughs> avoids speculative interest. And avoids the speculative interest. Yes. Two big issues we've been yes, trying to deal yes, with. Yes, now. yes, exactly. And how would that be done, in his view? Uh, if you have... Uh, it's a wonderful example we have right now in Manhattan. We have... Okay. We have uh, Times had the, had, a, had the estimate... It's over 40% of the commercial real estate space in Lower Manhattan, over 40%, mm -hmm. that's the drop from the peak of the market. 
Really? O- over 40%. 40%? Yeah, over 40%. You from mean the the occupancy or what? Yes, it's empty. Look at it. Go through Lower Manhattan. Really? And the, and the projection is by 2011, next year, it will be 58%. 58 percent of the what it was at the peak. Well, that been 99 or something or something. No, no, no. In the two, 2005, 2006, something in that. Oh, nature. okay. So that much of a drop. Go hey, wait a minute. Let me get it straight. Abandonment of commercial property uh, vacant, by 58 va- percent. Vacant, vacant, vacant commercial real estate. Re- Go through. How can that be? Walk. I mean, you li- you're living. I haven't that noticed. You know. Walk. Walked, I mean, not on a good day. I, yeah. I, I recommend no, it's that not last a good time. Wait till the sun shines. Wait till the sun, sun, sun shines, Nelly. Yes, right, right, right. Maybe till mm. spring comes. Go yeah. take a walk in Lower Manhattan for go uh, ten blocks. Uh, yeah, okay. that's what we we, we both are in that area. Why Lower Manhattan particularly? Because that was just what the article quoted. Oh, that would really happen to quote. That, that would it be characteristic of uh, you will find Manhattan. It would it be characteristic of New York? Would it be characteristic of the nation? Well, it's it's or it, that's it. Manhattan and Lower Manhattan is a bellwether of the rest of the country. Okay, as far as real you estate think is Lower concerned, Manhattan, you think Wall Street and finance? Of and course, stuff. of yeah. course, and, okay. and and certainly in Financial real estate, in, in, in of peak the world. F- in peak real estate, uh-huh. in peak real, peak real estate, yeah, right? Okay. okay. Okay, so you walk around and you will see a lot of empty real estate. Yeah, but these are statistics that give this fi- this huge figure of uh, uh, abandonment. Or no, uh, or okay, okay. Now, okay. what it is? What yeah. it is? Of course, they're holding the property out. They're holding the land out of use because they're speculating that the market will pick up. I mean, Peter Cooper, uh, mm-hmm. uh, Stuyvesant. That mm-hmm. was that's a, a prime example. They bought at the peak uh, 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 of the market five point nine billion. Mm-hmm. For that whole complex? For that whole complex. Mm. It was $6.5 billion altogether. They mm. had to put up another 900 for just for security, mm. for, for upkeep and so on and so forth. Yeah. They bought at the peak of the market, and now it's dropped to one-third of the original price. Yeah. It's $2, two billion something now. Well, that, that's a thing that runs counter to what allowed those middle-class and lower-class people to gain net worth through the appreciation over decades and it was thought that that w- that, that ever more they will be appreciating but that and is that is exactly you know, the and i think that's correct about the lower middle class people could get a, a net worth by having appreciation on their own real estate which was the only asset they had a chance to have any chance of accumulating and does the same apply to the industrial economy or to the factories and so forth? Let's stay f- for okay. a moment with the real estate. Let's okay, stay for a okay. moment with the land. Mm-hmm. Now, Henry George's insight is that if you allow this kind of land speculation, you will always get these boom and busts. You will always get these artificial bubbles. You have, a, you have a, a, um, a, a, an Australian uh, financial analyst named Philip Anderson who's written a good book the Secret Life of Real Estate just came out uh, a year ago, two years ago. Our mm-hmm. publisher has it. It's, uh, you can get it uh, in, in the in the current uh, trades, mm-hmm. the book trade. He comes up with a with a real estate cycle of about eighteen years. He's eighteen years. He's basing himself. Cycle, yeah, yeah. It's it's he calls it the real estate clock, and it goes around and it starts there from the l- from the down of the market, from the lowest from the trough of the market to the peak of the market. It's about a plus minus an 18 year cycle 18 years is that both commercial and, and domestic re- uh, and uh, residential R- real estate yes both commercial and residential really that encompasses both yes and what happens is let's say g- simple example uh Stewart airport f- i don't know what happened yeah, to Newburgh. it two, two, two years ago or something you you read in the times okay this is we want to have a fourth hub that was also before yeah. the market uh, uh, g- uh, crashed mm-hmm. Stewart Airport was de- designated as the fourth big hub yeah, right. after Kennedy, LaGuardia, and Newark mm-hmm. to feed the larger New York metropolitan area. Yeah, it's up say Newburgh, yeah. Okay, now let's say we had had, you and I had had a real estate business around Stewart Airport. Mm-hmm. And let's say, j- just hypothetically, let's say we had had this insider information mm-hmm. that Stewart was going to be vastly expanded mm-hmm. and would be made the big fourth airport of New York City. Or if back in the 19th century, you knew the railway was coming through. Yeah. Rock Ridge is going to come through Rock Ridge and same buy same property principle. in Rock Ridge. S- and s- s- yeah, right. that's yeah. But th- that's right. uh, I'm just yeah. going to stay with that one example a little bit. So. Had we had the inside information before it hit the media, mm-hmm. what would we have done? We would have gone to all the land around Stewart Airport and we would have bought it for peanuts. Mm-hmm. The moment the land uh, news, the news of that uh, uh, project of making a big airport, the moment that hits the news, 
what happens to the land price? It goes up. Way up. Mm -hmm. So that's the land speculation that Henry George is trying to avoid. Well, because that's land speculation, but what about the natural uh, increase? Uh, back again. To most people, they have a job, uh, and they can make money. They can make so much money by, and that's the way the income is distributed. But in terms of increasing their net worth, I mean, a banker or people at the top of the society are getting richer all the time doing nothing because they have they have co uh, well collateralized uh, ability to make investment in plant and equipment that's going to pay for itself out of the future earnings and so the 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 pond just gets bigger the poor the poorer classes of society do not have any collateral or any way to put up to do it and the only collateral that's ever been available to them because the assets are all owned by a tiny plutocratic class as they always have in every political economy around the world, whether they call themselves communists or capitalists, uh, the only way they had to get any, any ability to have a capital asset that had value was the residential property. And that's gone up steady. And there were any number of people, at least for five or six or six decades or something, everybody after the Second World War figured that the, the property was almost always going to go up. And on the whole, it did. That's and wrong. It's wrong. No, but, maybe, but it was, it's wrong that that was the case. That's why you always have these boom and bust cycles. But I don't know that you well, had... Would be, I'm glad we're talking about this. No, but I didn't what know it, anybody who, what it does who bought a house in 1950 that it wasn't worth more by 1980 or something. It, they all went up in value. Okay, it went up and then it crashed. An automobile and then goes... Will, and then an automo no, no, but... Uh, no, uh, oh, you you're, saying, the you're saying the real estate that that market always trend, goes up. a pattern that could Wh be why seen. Why did we have the crisis in 2007? Because it got out of hand. It got out but of hand. But if it's hand. natural, why would it get out of hand? Well, natural, okay. We're okay. back with the distinction between natural and, and speculative interest. I well, you think that was uh, people who bought residential property and the idea, there were lots of people who would do it. And that you uh, and you could even pay for the cost of the thing out of the fact that the, interest, the, the, the value is going to go up and it went up steadily. It seems to me everybody I knew uh, just knew that they were going to have the residential property. And if you talked five years ago, or 10 years ago or something, you said, is there going to be a boom in the real estate appreciation of your residential property? Said, of course not. It's been solid. That's the one solid thing we have. No, and they, 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 that's the way they got some I'm net worth because they had no other way to do it. I'm glad we're talking about this because what it leads us <coughs> to is the question, the question of economic value. Okay. What is economic value? Right. And attached to economic value is price. Mm -hmm. Some people know uh, the, the price of everything and the value of nothing, yeah. but it's, it's really linked to each other. Mm -hmm. It's linked mm -hmm. to each other. Yeah. So if you don't know the economic value, if you don't have an accurate indicator of economic value, you can't set a, a just price. Is the market good for that? We, the yes. market is an, instrument, is an, in, is yeah. an instrument, but yeah. now what is economic value? What determines economic value? What is it? Some people say it's the, the source of value is, uh, they got a labor theory of value that everything's created no, out of labor. We discussed the other day, you don't like the labor theory of value. Let's, I don't. Let's drop no. the value, labor theory of value for okay. a moment. No, I don't like a society set up where they, that's all the people have is their labor to get income to buy food. No. That the, ca the capital instruments are becoming more relevant in production as we move through time. Okay, now from the Scottish Enlightenment what, on, what is the, what is economic value, in a society? How is economic value created if there's zero production? Well, over I don't quite time. know. Well, zero production. You got. Let me pose to you something. Maybe Mr. George could deal with it. Suppose you go and you got. Uh, we have plant and in Adam Smith's day. There was nothing really manufactured, it was all hand manufactured. Everything that was made was made by hand. It was craftsman. That does make, that none of this But now you get to a point where Sara Lee, the Sara Lee company makes cheesecake. That, that's and I heard no, tell, none of this is none of this there's is not essential. a single human being working in there, but it's turning out cheesecake, uh, 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 and there are people uh, uh, to buy it, uh, uh, and so that's value. So are the machines going to eat the cheesecake? No, the machines are going to make the cheesecake, and the people but are going to have. Who are the cheese? The who is the cheesecake well, for? Let me, no, the for the cheese, machines. Let me make a model, or take another one, a combine. Let's just take a. Oh, I would say Sara Lee. That's better because they make great cheesecake. And they do it, and there are they can, they got a big factory, and they got all kinds of the, the ingredients that go into making the cheesecake. I, I and grant they got you all this. That's, and not, that's not, in discussion. Or that's like, not in discussion. And they go and they make this cheesecake, and let's suppose 
everybody in the society has an ownership stake in that company. That's and because that's they canceled. own that's, the capital that's assets, that's if, they, okay, if, that's they, if they own the capital assets, they will have enough money to buy the cheesecake that the machines will produce. If you have an assembly line and they can turn, or a combine that can produce 90 million bushels of wheat, and you own the left nut on the back wheel through, a, through an ownership of that combine, you have the money to buy the wheat. You have some way of distributing buying power to the people other than the labor, which Mr. Keynes said it's going to be displaced by technological uh, development, uh, that's and that's what's happening. And we've got a jo jobless recovery because we don't have a way of relating people to the way things are becoming produced through a process of it more and more technologically oriented production as opposed to the labor input to value. I have a great esteem for Keynes, but that's one issue. It's not Keynes, it's Kelso. This everything is going to be done by robots. That's one thing I beg to differ. Oh, okay. Now you think we can distribute by labor? Okay. No, not necessarily. We're going back to what is economic value. Okay. If there's zero production, mm -hmm. the point is, if there's zero production on a on the national scale, on a domestic scale, on yeah. a global scale, if there's right. zero production, there's zero economic value. Zero production y of the Sara Lee plant. Making anywhere, it. anywhere, any no human being in there at all. Nobody uh, forget, doing anything. Forget human beings or machines. Mm -hmm. If there is no production going on, there's no economic value. Well, what follows? Wait a second. Okay, what follows is mm -hmm. economic value is created through productivity. Now, no, no. Wait a minute. Productivity is a loaded word. It's always linked to labor. It's always linked to labor. It's productiveness of the technological forget instrument. For a moment, it why? It forget the difference between labor and capital, and just think of production. If there's okay. no production, there's no economic. Okay, value. stop for a minute. Le Sara Lee factory. There's no. Is there are no cheesecakes. Cheesecake. No, no cheesecakes. No oh, production. But why are you making no cheesecakes? I'm doing Sara Lee cheesecakes. Because I'm telling you, I'm, 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 I'm trying to tell line. you, the million cheesecakes need a million people to eat these cheesecakes. No, they need somebody who can buy the cheesecake, and they got no money to buy it if they don't have ownership of the machine that's making the cheesecake without anybody making it. There's my nobody in is, there. My point is, without production, you have no economic value. If we can agree on this, we, we make a big step okay. forward. I would like to know why would they would set up a factory to make cheesecake and then not make any cheesecake. They got all the wheat, they got all the cream, they got everything they That's need, they got the, the machines point. to mix That's it, the and point. they can Production make the cheesecake. Is hampered. Henry George says productive is hampered by wrong taxation. By but what? By wrong taxation okay, and by a wrong issue. economic... I don't understand. Well, that, that, that the point is that we are hampered in, in producing, and because we're hampered, the collective, not collective, the, 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 the global economic value, the domestic economic value, the national economic value is being subdued, is being diminished. Okay, I don't understand. I can understand if you don't, if the people don't have, the, the problem is we have a capability to produce an overflow of everything for everybody and the ecology. We have a capability. It's largely technologically induced. It's moving toward technology. We already all agreed the time we can produce the more than we need. We can produce more than we need. And what we don't have are people who have enough money in their hands to go in and buy the things that can be produced because there are not going to be any jobs for them to do on the estate of the people who own everything. And what they should have is everybody should have an ownership stake as a way to get money to buy what can be produced without their labor. That's an interesting perspective, and I'm not refuting that perspective. Well, I, you're not. I, I, no, it I'm seems not. to me you keep saying there's no production coming out of the cheesecake factory. No, what I'm with saying... With nobody in it doing it. I, I, I esteem... Or a combine in Kansas. Uh, Harold, mm. I esteem Kelso. But what I'm trying to get is, is we were discussing before what's economic value. We can't set the just price if we don't know the economic value. Now, economic okay. value is determined through production. Yeah. If there's no production, there's no economic value. Yeah, but you keep saying no production to this cheesecake factory. Why do you say no production? If because there's nobody be in there. Because I'm sitting. No, I, I'm no. not. I don't. I don't even want to make that. Okay. Okay. That we, we've I'm had, to we, we've really. had. We've had hundred years, 130 years we've been brainwashed. The Marxists brainwashed us and the neoclassicals brainwashed us that there is a distinction between labor and capital and that distinction is a to the, to the death cutthroat struggle for survival. Darwin is social Darwin is struggle for survival and that is complete nonsense. It is. You labor and com capital in Henry George's view and in the view of most intelligent classical <coughs> economists is the same thing in a different state. It's like water, maybe ice or maybe steam. It's the same thing.
Oh. So oh. what you Wait have... Labor and capital is the same. Is the same. They're in okay. two, two different saying. stages okay. of the same reality. Okay. So in Henry George's view and in the view of the classical economists, capital is not some mythological thing that fell from the sky, something that's like some people are gifted with Bill Gates and Buffett. They are like uh, these gifted capitalists because they... God graced them with this gift for capital. They, it's like Midas, everything they touch becomes gold, everything they touch becomes capital. Mm. That's not what it is. Okay. The original productivity before we had machines was labor. And then labor became more sophisticated and machinery became a tool for labor and it became a tool for productivity. And you were able to create a surplus. Now the guy like, guy like Diamond, anthropologists like Diamond say, we can only, excuse me, we can only create arts and sciences and human progress <coughs> when we can create a surplus. Marx yeah, says the same thing. Of course, of course, of if course. you don't have, if we're all just squanging around for food, for roots. Like we do when we're wandering around thank in the Thank you, forest. thank yeah, you. Then right. we're never getting anywhere. Right. So, yeah, no, that's obvious. Okay, so we have capital is our tools, machinery, technology, that's labor from yesterday, last week, last year, the stock that we put away for a rainy day that we put away to aid our productive processes. Do you agree as a Marxist calling it congealed labor? That's that's a way of looking at it. I don't have a George would see it that way. I don't have a problem with that. They, I don't have a problem with that. You don't have a problem with, with the congealed no, labor. No, no, it's all that's labor theory of value. You don't have a problem with. We don't have to get hypnotized by the labor theory of value. No, but everything if if it's not predicated, the theoretical understanding is not predicated. It is certainly the result in the warrior world. Is they're putting all, and Mr. Obama is just talking. Got to get everybody a job because their labor, and then our ideas of human worth and all these kind of values are tied up in the work ethic and all that sort of thing. Now, now w let's go back to what's the origin of any given economy. The origin of any given economy is the satisfaction of needs. Nobody in his right mind or her right mind would set up a cheesecake factory if there weren't a demand for cheesecake and if it were weren't effective demand, meaning purchasing power. Thank you. They haven't got any money because they don't own the machine so and they don't have a okay, role as a okay, place sweeping okay, up the okay, floor. Okay, okay, picking okay. up leaves here on the Lord's here we are. state. Here we are. You don't here have a way are. of distributing demand to the people of the world. People in Africa can't buy penicillin because they don't have any money. So everybody goes bust. No, 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 no. You have an alternate way of distributing income other than their labor. They want to, they're, they're waiting for the Lord to own everything for them to do something that we will think is okay for them to do in order to give value to what the, they the, do, the, and, they're, they're, and all our institutions are predicated upon that, and then they got these interest things in there where the people get a lot more because they've got the collateral and the advantage, and you've got a world that is heading for disaster if they don't come up with some sort of a way of distributing demand to the masses of the people to buy what can be produced by machinery and by technologically oriented productive oh, okay. systems that don't need their participation in the in the production. L uh, and it may be coming from the Islamic world where those things will come because we're so caught up in that enjant regime like kind of attitude toward that, the Western world and their running dog allies, that we're the major problem and the institutions are going to have to be made uh, amenable to letting some effective demand be in the hands of the people by virtue of their ownership of a technological system that gives them money to buy what the technological system can produce, and that's the problem, supply-demand. Okay, uh, uh, let me try to understand. Let me ask you this, Harold. I'm, I'm trying to understand your, your, your Kelsonian vision. Your Kelsonian vision is a kind of cornucopia where everybody l is laid back, everybody has their feet up. Absolutely. Nobody works. No. And to the, the degree and possible, and yes. And, and, the, and, the, no, and, everybody and the fried works. chicken, no. the fried chicken fly into your mouth when you open it. Not more. You're being, and it's you're everything being facetious, being that's okay. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm trying to understand. More or less, yes. We are on the verge of liberation from an outdated system that we've inherited since about 200,000 years because the ontology has changed. We have a capability of applying it. I'm to trying to understand. I'm, trying to understand it. I'm, I'm not contesting you. I'm trying to understand. So, you, in, in other words, 100% of the basic needs will be covered by robots. I mean, that's a very. I don't say by robots. I or say machines, whatever. So, no human being would touch any more. 
Would, no, but it would, would free be, human beings to be concerned with rather than being wage slaves within fascistic corporate systems that have everybody, educational systems, a canon that keeps everything locked in within paradigms and peer review systems that only reify outdated institutions we've inherited out of history. We will have a vision of a liberation of people who are free from having to be caught up within that slavery and are free to do what it is they want to do, like maybe art and some of the things that really matter, rather than checking out things within a corporate thing, that we live in a slave I'm, system. I'm, I'm glad we... And we I'm, need to have a I'm, way I'm of glad, alternate glad, way of distributing income to people other than their labor participation. And all of our folklore, and everything is caught up in that. We're all caught up with an outdated... It's an enjant regime that runs the world, and we have to have a vision of a transformation because things have changed in the modern experience. Liberation is at hand just as we are at a point where we can also destroy the whole homo sapiens species with the weapons that we've developed following these old outdated systems. I'm That's what I'm saying. We live at a time of qualitative transformation. I'm, I'm glad we're talking about and this. And maybe the, the yeah, leading understand. thing, the interesting, the, the impetus to that is probably going to come from the Islamic world. And that part of it holds on to the proscription against usury because the fact that we've allowed that to come in in the Western model and our running dog allies in China and India and everywhere else are out of date, Latin America, we need, an ins we need a vision of an alternate way, a major paradigm of paradigm shifts. That's all I'm saying. Well, I'm glad we're talking about this because I didn't understand your, 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 your perspective to that extent. For you, any kind of labor is like almost like slavery, and if we can delegate this kind of physical labor or this kind of undignified labor to machines, then we liberate our potential for higher things or for other things, yeah, art, and science, we, and so no, on. No, and we also get a way for people to buy the things that can be produced instead of reifying their slave-like status to fascistic, authoritarian, organizational principles, whether it's private sector or public sector and a lot of mythology. And I think Mr. Keynes is right because people are getting in the way. Now, what people about, are getting in the about, way of the production. Okay, what about dignified labor? What about people who... Dignified labor is labor which freed people do. Okay. They don't have to do it. Let Most me, people don't even think that okay, they can do let anything let me, that they want to do. They have to do what they have to do in order for to meet the needs of the master's demand. Let me, let me ask you a question. They had, a, they, they had in the 70s, 60s and 70s, they had this movement to go to the land communes. And the people were tired of the cities. People were tired of the alienation in the cities. And they said, okay, let's go back to the land, let's go back to nature, Thoreau, Rousseau, and let's work the land. No, as, free, as free owners, as free agents on the land, I love the touch of the earth. People like to work with plants, they like to touch with the, the earth that's invigorating, and we are... Is, th is that legitimate? Is no, that no. Legitimate? The world is going to be measured from 2,000 years from now. The major transformative moment in that will be the year one will be around the year 1970. That's when the, we transcended scarcity in terms of our technologically augmented capability of providing life support to the human population and the ecology, and when the weapon systems became species lethal. There was, there was fuller, fuller. Well, it's fuller and other people who think that that's a major thing, that, that it's not your normal time. We're at a time of qualitative transformation like punctuated equilibrium in species or birth, the water breaking. We're coming into